Welcome to A Tale of Two Cities when Yahoo and AOL blended open source programs. Hi, I'm Gil Yehuda. I um, am responsible for external technology engagement in a company called Verizon Media, and you'll learn a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about what Verizon Media is. I'm joined with Ashley Wolf. I'm the open source program manager at Verizon Media. OK, so what we wanted to do is for those of you who have 11 other sessions that you wanted to go to and you weren't sure which one to go to, is just sum this up into one slide. So if there was one slide you wanted to know, this is the one that sums up the rest of the talk. And then if you, when we're done, you can leave. But I hope you don't. But the talk is all about the following message. Your company probably needs an open source program office. And we're going to arrive at that conclusion by telling you some stories about the open source program office that we've built at Verizon Media. We're going to make the argument that not having an open source program um, is a problem for your company and that having an open source program is very good for your company. We're going to do that by sharing some stories and getting into some details on those stories and then you know, facilitating any questions that you have. It was the best of times. And it was the worst of times. The last few years have been pretty good and very interesting. In 2016, Verizon acquired AOL, and in the following year, Verizon acquired Yahoo. We merged the two companies together into a business unit called Oath. The name was a bit strange, but that's OK. Earlier this year, we renamed it to Verizon Media. The business continues to operate. We're a bunch of advertising, technology, B2B brands, and commerce. We're a house of brands, actually. We're TechCrunch. We are Yahoo Mail, Fantasy Sports. Tumblr, and Gadget, and a bunch more. Yeah, and it was also uh, the worst of times because even though some of these companies are really cool, companies are also challenging. Um, merging companies is very challenging and political. The tech press doesn't necessarily treat companies very nicely when it talks about them and isn't always accurate in terms of what you know they report when it comes to what mergers are all about. Merging companies involve merging cultures, and merging cultures is a difficult thing. So what we wanted to do is talk about some of the stories and the politics and the challenges that we had, but not because we wanted to air dirty laundry. We actually want to drive to some lessons that we learned and shared those lessons, um, but using the stories to do so. Um, so e pluribus unum, that's the United States motto. It means out of many, one. In our case, our presentation's called A Tale of Two Cities, but it's actually a lot more than that. AOL and Yahoo, when they came together, each comprised of about 50 startups and thousands of people. And they were actively working on integrating all the different culture that was taking place with the startups, and that's where things got even more complicated. Okay, so one of the things that we focused on when we were trying to bring together um, AOL and Yahoo into one company is we recognize that both companies are kind of engineering companies. They've been long-time engineering companies. And we wanted to focus on engineering culture. And the question that we asked ourselves is like we use the term engineering culture, but we don't necessarily know what the term means. You know, so we thought about like what kind of questions could we ask that would maybe give hints, give, give some sort of indication as to what culture means in an engineering world. So for instance, like what's the role of engineering in your company? Sort of an interesting question. Like where does engineering fit in? Not organizationally, but like pr from a process perspective, philosophically. Um, another question, how effective is governance when it comes to technology? Like if you're CTO or if you're chief architect or if the CISO says, you know, you can't do this or you must do that, do the product teams listen? Or do the product teams say, I'm sorry, that's really interesting and I wish I could, but I have a product and that product has to be delivered next week and therefore I don't have to listen because product really reigns supreme over engineering. Um, also, how do other companies perceive you? So you might perceive yourself one way, but if the industry doesn't perceive you that way, then you know, maybe there's a cultural element to work on. And, and we kind of try to distill it down to one question, which I think should come. Here we go. Um, <laughs> is software created in anticipation of a need or in response to a need? So for example, are you the kind of company that looks at blockchain and say, hey, blockchain is this really cool technology. What could we do with it? 
right? Or are you the kind of company that says, we need to build a following product. In order to build a following product, we need to have something that moves data at scale from one place to another. Therefore, we have to have an engineering team build, an engineering team build that thing that moves from one to another. In other words, is technology driven by your products or does technology enable your products? Turns out that the difference between the two kind of companies, a product-driven or engineering-driven uh, kind of company, will inform the kind of open source program you may or may not have. Um, in some cases, in a very engineering-driven kind of company, you will have an open source program because you need it to drive your engineering culture. In another kind of company where engineering is really subordinate to where you want to go, you might not have an open source program at all. So what happens if you don't have an open source program? The truth is most engineers are going to get it right. They're going to do the wrong things, the right things, but it takes just a couple of people to do the wrong things and you'll create a lot of problems. Without an OSPO, people won't have a place to go to ask questions about publishing code, contributing to projects, or using third-party libraries inside of the company. Some of the questions that go unanswered are what, what happens or who's responsible for removing people from GitHub once somebody leaves the company, How, who's monitoring if everybody in an organization has two-factor authentication turned on, is it okay for me to publish code that has no license, is it okay to publish code without an owner, all of these things will go unanswered. Uh, theoretically, these are the kind of questions that you might face. Now, if you're interested in starting an OSPO, and you should consider it, you should find the people in your company who care about these issues. There's at least four people in your company who wish you had an OSPO, and they might not even know it yet. Your CTO cares about reducing tech debt. Your lawyers are going to care about reducing any and minimizing any legal risk, especially having people that are on the front lines to answer questions about licenses. HR cares about attracting and retaining talent, as well as your CTO, probably, and your CISO. They definitely care about if people are leaking code, if proprietary information is getting outside of the company. OK, so this was an interesting setup. And it really comes to this sort of statement that we all know that blending companies is hard. And this is the part of the presentation where we're supposed to now impart this really profound insight about how to do it right. And when we were preparing this presentation, we we're thinking like, OK, so what is that profound insight that we're going to deliver to the people who've taken the time? Um, what did we do to build a blended open source program in an environment where we had culture clash, we had many engineers doing the right thing, but we had those theoretical questions that became theoretical issues that we had to worry about, right? So what do we do to make um, unification of diverse groups of people who work for different things. How do we bring it together? And we, we thought about this, and we actually had a really good insight, which I'm going to share with you. Turns out that the secret to creating a blended open source program office is the very same secret to creating a successful open source project. And if you think about what does it take to create an open source project, wait. There we go. One of the things you need as a baseline is a concept called shared fate. We're in the same boat. So if you need this and I need this, or if you have this outcome that is positive and I have the same outcome, we're in the same boat. Now, when you blend company together, you say, well, you know, if we're profitable, we all get bonuses this year. And if we have a legal problem, then we all suffer from that legal problem. We have shared fate. But you need more than shared fate because that becomes obvious, and yet the problem is hard. You also need shared faith. So shared faith is the concept that not only are we in the same boat, but we choose to go to the same destination together. We both want to travel to where we're supposed to go. Right? And that's what you have in a successful open source project. And the third is that there's this efficiency, that the, that the cost of us working together, the transaction cost of us building whatever infrastructure we need so that you review my code, or that somebody else commits the code, or that some technical review committee has oversight, that that, pro that overhead is worth it because the value is even greater than the cost of that transaction. Right? So when you have that notion of shared fate, we're in this together, shared faith, 
we want to go to the same place. And we've been able to increase the value relative to the cost of transaction. You have the necessary components for an open source project. And as it turns out, you have the necessary components for a blended open source program office. So that's what we did. We focused on the shared objectives that we have as a company. For instance, we all need to control tech debt. We're all affected by it. If we run out of money because we forked code and we didn't contribute back to, uh, to upstream and we're building things that didn't need to be built, then we're not going to have money or resources for the next project that we want to do. Similarly, we all care about achieving excellence, right? and it's important as a company that we do so. And finally, we want to make sure that we don't have any legal complications because open source, at the end of the day, there is some element of, of legal, um, you know, making some interesting decisions and in that we didn't want that to to be chanced upon everyone making an independent decision. So those, that was sort of our shared fate outcome. And then from a shared faith perspective, we also had shared values across the multiple companies that we're bringing together. We all want to support engineers. Like we all want to make sure that engineers have a great time in the company and know what they need to do in order to be successful. We want to make sure that we can hire and retain so that we're properly branded as a, technical, as a tech company. And engineers know that one of the options, if they want to work on a really cool technology project, whether it's AI or machine learning or, or big data or whatever, is like they can go to the company um, that built a lot of the great technology and continues to do so. And then finally, we all want to be good citizens and open source. Now, that might not be enough to drive building an open source program office, but it's enough to unite people together once they've decided that we need to do that to say, well, we have this in common. So having the shared fate and the shared faith means that we have to then just put together an efficient open source program, which is what we did. We created the open source program office at Verizon Media. Gil here is our senior director. I'm the program manager. And we have our senior community manager, Rosalie, here in the room with us. And we're hiring, so if anybody's interested, please find us in the hallways and we can chat about what opportunities we have available. Our groups in the platforms engineering organization, we work across the company with plenty of groups. Some of them are listed here, legal, on licensing, approvals, M&A. Paranoids is what we lovingly called our information security team tech PR, HR, and we have external technology partners that we work with as well. We run a fairly typical open source program office. If anybody's interested, feel free to snap a photo here of what we think summarizes the services that we provide to engineers at the company. Right, so it runs the gamut, inbound, outbound, legal, new projects, stuff Next like that. Us. And then operationally, here is a breakdown of how that plays out. So we have our program management where we do the inbound, outbound work, talk to engineers about contributions. We do community management work as well as compliance. And most recently, we found that we've been spending about a quarter of our time focused on security alerts on GitHub. So we wanted to highlight that as well. A look at our numbers for the program. We work with about 600 engineers who are engaged with our group. That's about 10% of all the engineers at our company. We think that's pretty good, but we definitely want to see higher numbers there. On average, quarterly, we have about 300 tickets that we work through in JIRA. Our team is in there with the engineers, getting help, and we also include legal on those as well. We have hundreds of projects that we manage and provide support for. So we have strategic projects, active projects, and then as a whole, we have about 400 on GitHub today. This year, we focused on promoting the projects a lot better. We have podcasts, blog posts, and YouTube videos, which Gil will talk about a little bit more later. And finally, on the compliance side, we manage about 200 mobile and TV apps. To take a step back, I want to talk about what actually happened when we merged Yahoo and AOL's open source program offices. Yahoo had a very active open source program office. AOL did not. So the first thing that we did is reviewed all the assets that we had on GitHub. And what we found was pretty messy. There was hundreds of projects that shouldn't have been on there. There was hundreds of people that had access to projects that shouldn't have access anymore, maybe because they left. And there was also dozens of projects with content like embarrassing content in readme's that shouldn't be there, poorly licensed projects, and so on. 
So the first thing we did was make an inventory of all this information and tried to identify project owners and get a sense of everything that needed to be updated. We reached out to everyone, we had timelines, and if they didn't reply or update, we aggressively archived them. And one year later, we're in a much better place. When we did the inventory, we found a couple of things that actually stood out as being like really good news, right? So that's part of the story here is that there was <laughs> Worst of times, best of times, right? Um, it was tough work finding, it was, it was emotionally difficult finding all the stuff out there and saying, wow, this is a real mess and we have months of work ahead of us to clean this up and to get this into a state that we're okay with. But we also had the opportunity to look and find, to find um, projects that were really cool and interesting and strategic and said, and we said to ourselves, we should actually show some love to these projects. They're important to us so much so that we want to make sure that they get the kind of visibility that they deserve. We, as Ashley said, we have like 400 projects out there, but you know, we have some of those projects that are more favorite than others, and, and we identified these seven that we wanted to invest a little more in. And the good news is that um, some of these projects came from one of the companies that we blended in, and some of these came from the other company that we blended in, and it was really this attempt to say, yes, Yahoo was a larger company and had a greater investment in technology than AOL did, and yet the quality of technology that came out of AOL was quite good. It just wasn't as much of a volume of, uh, of said technology, but the quality was fantastic, and, and, um, and our ability to bring it together was also a, a great unifier to say that this is really a blended open source project. We then built a website, so we also have, as many other companies do, an open source website at opensource.yahoo.com. Um, and there at opensource.yahoo.com, you can see the more strategic projects. You can also see the listing of other projects that we have. Of course, you can find them on GitHub as well. Um, but as Ashley mentioned a moment ago, we also uh, wanted to market our projects a little better. So we have a podcast. We publish um, a podcast about once a month. Um, and in fact, we're recording a couple of podcasts tomorrow. So if people are really interested, Rosalie is over here and we're actually going to be recording podcasts because um, we want to hear what other people have to say about open source. We think this is interesting. So we're going to we talk about our projects, but we also want to talk about the things that are interesting to the open source community at large. So we have that. Um, we built out a website for it, just a little plug. We built out a website for our podcast in addition to them being like on iTunes and, and, and SoundCloud and Spotify. We built our own site because we wanted... Um, the transcripts to be on a website for accessibility reasons, well, accessibility and search ability reasons. And on most of the platforms, you can't put transcripts. Um, you can't transcribe your podcast and put it out there. So people who, I don't know, don't hear, um, or people who don't have their headphones and are on the train, whether they're, they're not a hearing person or they're currently not able to listen to the podcast, we have the ability for you to read the podcast and to do text search on that too. So. I don't know, suggest improvement to the industry, make podcasting tools accessible by having transcripts built in. But in the meantime, we just built it on our website. Um, we also have blogs that we publish about weekly on some of the projects. Um, and if you notice something that maybe was interesting, because maybe some of your eyes perked up, the open source website is on opensource.yahoo.com. And yet, you heard that the name of the company was Oath, and then it's Verizon Media, and we had this little bit of a name challenge going on. Um, the challenge is still going. Like I don't think the story is fully resolved, but in the current state of affairs, we've put all of our open source assets in our Yahoo brand, so the open source website is still there. And we went to the press and started talking about like what we do as a company. We want to make sure that the industry doesn't forget that Yahoo is still around, the products are still there. You want finance information, you're going to go to Yahoo Finance. If you're into sports, you're going to go to Yahoo Sports because it's a great site. So all of those products are still around. They happen to be business owned by another entity, um, but they operate independently. And similarly, when it comes to our open source program, for the most part, it's driven out of the Yahoo engineering team. And for the most part, it's the legacy of the Yahoo contributions, in particular to big data and some other, other uh, open source industries that, um, that we continue to, to share um, publicly. Next slide. So here we go. <laughs> Unlike the book, The Tale of Two Cities, um, our story ends with no beheadings, which is good, especially for people who work for a living. Um, but we do have sort of that story, which is blending companies is absolutely not easy. And for those of you who 
are in a company that was acquired, whether it be the large acquisitions like the one that just closed last week very famously in the open source industry or the Microsoft GitHub acquisition that happened a few months ago, um, or small acquisitions. I've met a couple of attendees who said that they work for a company that was acquired by their competitor and that's just awkward, right? So yes, it's awkward and yes, integration is difficult. But then again, we're open source people. Working with your competitor on an open source project is awkward. You have to explain to your boss why you're working with somebody from another company, in fact, the company you compete with, on sharing code. And your boss might not get it. Well, similarly, when you're in a company that's blended, you're working with somebody who might have been your former competitor. But you say, well, let's go back. Shared fate, shared faith, right? So um, pointing out mistakes was a technique that we used. It did, it did help um, be constructive about pointing out mistakes, because doing it right helps. Doing it wrong um, doesn't. It does take a team. Um, it takes more than one person because there are a lot of things going on in, in any medium to large, large size company. It, this is more than a one person job. Uh, in order to be successful, the value you provide has to be greater than the cost of providing that value. Otherwise, you're actually just not worth it, right? Um, and, and as I said, uh, we have some takeaway messages. Sure, so here's the TLDR like we did at the beginning. First and foremost, you probably want an open source program office if you're here listening to this talk. It's not one size fits all, but if you start with seeking out the executives who care about the issues, security, talent, engineering, culture, and such, you'll be able to get alignment on the goals and values that are important. So whether you want to start an open source program office for a single company or a blend in company, that's what we feel are the steps to do so. So with that, um we thank you for joining us through this little journey. We are going to welcome your questions. Um, we are going to remind you that the way this works here um, at the conference is that there's like this little tool that you rate the session. So we'd like you to do that because that's a nice thing to do to provide feedback. Um, and you know what? I'm just going to go off script for a moment and just do a little plug for this organization called the To Do Group. Um, which is a collaboration that some of you may have heard of. It's a group of open source program managers of different open source program offices in the tech industry. Uh, we're a member of the To Do Group, todogroup.org, um, and we share these kind of things. So for companies who are interested in building out an open source program, we share uh, best practices. We have a couple of blog posts and guides that help. So if that's your interest, um, do follow up with that. But if your interest is more about the story of Yahoo, AOL, and Verizon Media, uh, we're here for your questions. If you guys have questions, um, please come up and ask them here at the central mic if you can. So it ends up on video. Um, if you can't make it up here, I'm glad to run it out. Just wave your arms until I notice. Hey there. Uh, as I was uh, looking at the presentation and hearing what you're talking about, it seems like some of the goals and approach are kind of similar to what like an enterprise architecture might group at a company. I'm curious if there is like an enterprise architecture team and how you guys relate to that or, you know, thoughts about that. At Verizon Media, we don't have a group that's called as such. We have teams of engineering program managers that go around doing that sort of work and advising and consulting. At Verizon Proper, which is our parent company, they do run a program related to their inner source efforts specifically for evolutionary architecture. Right, right. So, um, it's a good observation. Uh, in both cases, enterprise architecture and open source governance, you're dealing with a horizontal kind of service that provides a layer of value to all the product teams and platform teams. Um, and the good and the bad, right? So the good is that you want that kind of consistency mm -hmm. and perspective across the horizontal, all the different groups that you have. And the bad is that each of the product groups get annoyed by you because they're driven to deliver a product by a certain date. And here comes this you know, horizontally focused platform person that says, no, you ought to do CI CD, and no, you ought to do like test case automation, and no, you ought to make sure to use these licenses and we need to comply and inject something in your build system to make sure that you've complied and, and do all these things. And they're like, yeah, but I have a date and a deliverable, right? So the very same set of negotiations that you have to do for enterprise governance um, applies to open source. And that's why I started with that sort of that engineering culture slide. If you have a culture that supports uh, a kind of governance where engineering has a voice that 
not only informs what your next product is going to be and how well it's delivered on time, but what your product life cycle is and what the um, platform of the portfolio of products that you have. So not just, you know, next version of this app, next date, but how are we doing engineering-wise holistically? You kind of need somebody who's going to be that opposing perspective to your product teams that must, of course, deliver on time and within budget as their bread and butter. Um, so yeah, it, it is a very similar sort of pattern, yes. Um, and similarly, I would suggest that much like an enterprise architecture team might report into the office of the CTO or some sort of comparable position where they have horizontal focus, I would suggest that an office, uh, an open source program office would also um, report into an office of the CTO or office of a chief architect or some sort of horizontally focused um, thing. Yeah. And that's what we have at Verizon Media. Well, kind of. Close. Close enough. Hello, Gil and Ashley. Um, I have a question. At what stage do you, would you trigger that you need an open source off, office? Like, you know, usually companies start off a little small, and then suddenly they realize, okay, um, this is running away from us. Um, what are the conditions that you believe is it's time to think about building an open source office? Okay. Program office? It's an excellent question. It's very hard. Um, it's very hard to give an answer that uh, works because all companies are different. So in the very small startup company, you rarely have an open source program, right? Because you have just as many engineers as you need to make a compelling enough demo to get the kind of next round of funding so that you can then exit, well, either get really big if that's what your ambition is or to be acquired if that's what your ambition is, right? So you really don't have the time to do that. But remember that if your goal is to be acquired, then even if you're a small company, somebody in the company has to take a look at open source because that will come, that will be part of the M&A process, right? So if your goal, if you're a very small company and the goal that somebody in the company knows, maybe not everyone knows, but the leadership knows, is to be acquired, make sure that somebody is on board with open source, just at least from the risk perspective, let alone the value, right? at least make sure that you don't have um, an acquisition blocked um, or money withheld in some sort of reserve because of liability, right? Because that, that will come up. Um, if you've passed that stage where you're not looking to be acquired, you're actually just looking to grow a successful company, then there is the stage where you're looking beyond your next release and you're cognizant of tech debt, where you say decisions that I make in this quarter, I'm creating future debt that I'm gonna have to pay in two quarters from now, and if, you, if you're stable enough where you're doing that kind of planning, where you say, I'm building this, I figured it's gonna live for maybe a year or two, I will then replace it with something else, right? So if you're, if you're at that stage where you're doing long-term planning, that's where you need to have some open source strategy, where you say, well, wait, which project am I investing in? Which community is strong? Am I pour, pouring eggs into the right basket? Um, Am I taking from this community and neglecting to contribute back? I might need to do that because it's not my highest priority today to contribute back because I need a deliverable next week and I need all engineers on board to make sure that it all works. But if I kick the can too far, then I forked and now I'm, now I'm in, a, in a less uh, strategic position. That was a good recovery. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So if you're, if you're at that stage of maturity where you're looking beyond your next demo and you're looking at the portfolio and life cycle, which you should hopefully get to early if you want to be a successful company, then you should at least have somebody whose job it is to make sure they're looking at this stuff. Now, when you're a large enough company, you then begin to specialize and say it's not just somebody, the weekend warrior who's the person you go to when you want to publish something on GitHub or the person you go to when you have a question. You then formalize it. Um, Yahoo was a large company, AOL was a pretty large company, Verizon is a very large company, so we're kind of used to the large company dynamic where open source program offices have anywhere between three to 18 people on staff whose job it is to either be developer advocates, to license review, um, managing stuff on GitHub, uh, intern, GitHub enter, whatever, internal source code repository and quality, um, external publication and, and developer advocacy. Um, so that, at a large company, you're, you're gonna have a, I don't know, three to 10, three to 20 um, 
staffed person. Oh, oh. The team, the team itself might only be four or five people, but the extended team, like the go-to lawyer, right, and the go-to person in marketing. So that's sort of like the virtual team. They don't necessarily all have to report into that program office, but they kind of have to have, you know, they're the go-to person for open source related foundation, open source related community, open source related, you know, M&A, open source related license. What, what, you know, the attribution that goes into the app or something like that. I hope that answered the question. I, I was really interested to see how many projects uh, you're associated with, although with your size, maybe I shouldn't be surprised. Um, how is that is the selection of projects completely engineer driven? Is it top down? Is it a meld? And like how how does that how do you add projects to your portfolio? So in our case, there it's a blend. It's a hybrid of all of those things. There's some that are top down where we might receive word from some leadership that there's something that we should focus on and that may qualify for a strategic project. For others, it could be the case that the engineers are rallying behind it in a specific group and they think it qualifies to be a strategic project. We review each on a case-by-case -case basis. We ask everybody to go through the same process to submit a ticket and we work with them to assess whether it's something that makes sense for the company, for the community, and so on. Right, and, and I'll, just, I'll just add to that. Um, the, the number of projects that we have that we manage on GitHub, those are like our projects that we created and published, but we contribute to lots of other projects too, right? So we actually have a team of, I think 30 to 40 people um, on this team whose full-time job is to contribute to about a dozen Apache projects, okay? Their full-time job, they come into work and they contribute to Hadoop, Storm, Spark, Uzi, Zookeeper, Bookkeeper, Hive, um, like all, the whole plethora of, of, uh, of Apache projects, their job is to contribute to those projects because we use those projects in, in production. We want to make sure that they continue to thrive. And we found that um, paying somebody to, like, is their job to be a committer, to be on the technical uh, program, a PMC member uh, in the Apache case. So we, we contribute to a, um, a lot of Apache projects, to OpenStack projects, um, to a bunch of projects and uh, uh, a bunch of other foundations that are managed and governed by other, um, by other entities. Uh, and we have projects that we ourselves manage. In many cases, we, we want to move those projects to um, foundation. So for instance, I mentioned there are seven strategic projects. Well, one of them, data sketches, is now Apache data sketches because it was accepted into the incubator. And we look at those projects and say, we would like to offload the ownership and, and to really expand it to the community um, because we think that that's where uh, it can go. In other cases, it's just somebody's really interesting code that they wanted out there. And we said, okay, but well, we just need to review it before you put it out there. Um, and that's why we have, and actually that number, we've archived quite a bit, right? So it, it was a larger number and we just went in and said, you know what, this project has had its day and now it's time to put the archive flag on it because if we get an issue, we don't want to signal to the community that we're not listening. We want to signal to the community, yes, thank you, you can fork the code and use it. We, we don't have anyone to pay attention to it. So we're going to leave it there as archive, but we're going to leave it there and not pay attention to it. And, and therefore delist it from our website and stuff like that. You know what I mean? It's like, you can find it, but we're not going to. Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, you can find us in the hallway. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us um, in a bunch of places. And please do reach out to us if you have questions. And certainly, if you're interested in some of the positions that we have available, because we are a tech company, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you.